Hello again, Gary Stearman with another commentary from Prophecy Watchers. Today I'm reading a, uh, an item from Yahoo News dated February 20th, 2017. It's an article that I find quite fascinating given our discussions uh, with a number of, uh, of uh, Bible uh, expositors uh, who today are, are talking about some of the grim realities of Bible prophecy. L.A. Marzulli, for example, speaks of human-animal chimeras uh, hearkening back to, to the ancient days. And back in the ancient days, of course, uh, chimeras seem, seem to have been quite common, a chimera being some combination of human and animal, like a satyr has a human upper body, uh, uh, a head with horns, and the lower body is a goat. Or how about a centaur, upper body human, lower body a horse. Now how about the Egyptian uh, god Thoth, the god of writing and of in intellect, who had a human body and the head of an ibis? Or Bast, uh, the Egyptian goddess uh, who had uh, the head of a cat and the body of a woman? On and on and on. You can go through literally hundreds of examples of uh, chimeras in the ancient days. I was drawn to this article because it's, it's an article whose headline says the following. <clears throat> Grown pig chimeras are only a few years away. Fully grown human pig chimeras is what we're talking about here. Uh, and we need, says the article, to understand this now before it comes to pass as a reality. Uh, why would you grow a, a human pig chimera? Genetically, uh, a pig is close enough to a human being that you can grow it for spare parts, kidneys, heart, even lungs. Some people have said you could replace parts of a brain, and there uh, the story gets kind of murky. Let me read, <clears throat> and, and I'll begin at the top of this article. It says, if you needed an organ transplant, would you mind if it had been grown in an animal from human stem cells? Or would you do it but deep down find it frighteningly unnatural? Uh, all this may sound like science fiction, but scientists recently managed to implant human cells into a pig embryo, pushing us a step closer to such a future. There are also uh, other uh, applications. These would be very important applications uh, that stem from uh, this research, such as the study of developmental processes and diseases of many kinds. What we're talking about here is a, uh, to, to begin with, a pig with human spare parts, more and more spare parts, to the point that you wouldn't really be able to tell whether it was a pig or a human being. <clears throat> and the idea is that we, it, we might be able to glean enough to keep ourselves living a little longer. But if you're like me, already the hair on the back of your neck is beginning to stand up because uh, while we're at a minimum several steps away from accomplishing this, at the rate things are, are going today it, it might not be too long. <clears throat> in a, and I'm going to continue the uh, second paragraph of this article in a uh, useful recent survey, Robert Streifer identified several distinct concerns and discussed whether they're worthy of attention. Uh, many readers will share these concerns, says this article, although <clears throat> they might leave you cold. One is that creating chimeras is wrong because it violates the boundaries between uh, species. It is some somewhat morally Pro, pro, uh, problematic. It is uh, unnatural and therefore it's repugnant. Uh, another is the idea of the creation of chimeras will threaten uh, social practices that depend upon strong human-animal distinctions such as the farming of animals for food. Oops, if you're growing them for human spare parts and then eating them, oh, doesn't that violate some moral boundaries? And on and on it goes. Some of the questions I, I can't even imagine, but I think you're way ahead of me there. Many people also believe that chimeric research will threaten human dignity. <clears throat> and I would add, what about human sanctity? Uh, uh, sanctity as a creation of God. That's what really, really uh, bothers me about this. This is progressing, by the way. 
uh, you'll see more and more articles about human-animal chimeras. Uh, and some of these have already been uh, accomplished, uh, genetically modifying sheep, gen genetically modifying rats, and, and now pigs. Um, how about this? Uh, the author of this article says, one area of concern that I do find salient and important, however, has to do with the moral status of chimeric beings. Uh, as Streifer also noted, if a chimeric animal's moral status is enhanced, then society must pre be prepared to deal with it. Uh, as an extreme example, consider a chimera with human-like cognitive abilities. That is, let's suppose we have a human uh, pig chimera with a humanoid brain, and suddenly this animal is able to size up its environment in, in a very human fashion. Hmm. Such a chimera could conceivably be raised in a society that hasn't thought about how to address this, places no uh, weight upon its uh, enhanced cognition, but what's the moral status of an animal, say, with a, a pig with a human brain that can think like a human but cannot articulate speech, uh, cannot uh, voice uh, complaint, etc.? Well, this whole thing uh, assumes, I think, almost hellish proportions, and it's being, being considered right now as uh, a possibility uh, to uh, increase our ability to heal our illnesses. Human-animal chimeras, wow. Uh, gives me the creeps. Another reason it gives me the creeps is because the ancient world was absolutely loaded with human-animal chimeras. They were everywhere. Uh, all of their mythology, <clears throat> all of the histories, the, the Greco-Roman histories, the Persian histories, the Babylonian histories speak of these things. And of course we uh, uh, tend to look at them <clears throat> as simply uh, figments of human imagination. But what if there were chimeras created by some diabolical hellacious uh, power that we know nothing about. Uh, when the gates of hell are opened, I think anything can happen. Well, I'm raising this question for one reason, and that's to read Psalm 139. Uh, King David, somewhat close to 3,000 years ago, uh, wrote uh, many of the Psalms, and, and David was an amazing, amazing man. Grew up as a shepherd. Uh, God raised him up to strength, made him a warrior. He became a king. Uh, he's a, a super illustration uh, of the grace of God. He was a musician. The Psalms were set to music. He was a poet. He was a philosopher. Uh, Psalm 139. O Lord, Thou hast stretched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. <clears throat> For there's not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid Thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? David is just saying, God, you are everywhere and everything. Verse 8 says, if I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to me, for thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Now this is the part that I'm coming to. Uh, David says here in verse 13, he says concerning God, you have possessed me in my reins, is the, the uh, King James way of saying, my inner parts, my structures, the bodily structures. 
uh, you have covered me in my mother's womb. In other words, while I was being formed, uh, you were there. Verse 14 says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth very, very well. Verse 15 says, my substance was not hid from thee. And, and here he's talking about his physical substance. Uh, when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book are all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Did you get that? <laughs> Here in verse 16, David says concerning God, in thy book were all my members were written. You know, <clears throat> a couple decades ago, Physical science uh, became able through uh, a study of DNA uh, encoding to write a long, long formulation of all of the DNA codes that make up a human being. And they wrote all these down and put them in a book. And believe it or not, they called that book the Book of Life. Well, long before that, God has a Book of Life. And David says, in thy book, all my members are written. This is David's poetic way of saying, my DNA has been recorded with you, Lord. And you fashioned them. You caused the elements of my DNA to come together when yet there was none of them. Verse 17 says, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are, are more in number than the sand. And by the way, the, the uh, sheer massive numbers of DNA encoding are practically beyond uh, calculation. <clears throat> if I should count them, says David, they are more in number uh, than the sand. When I wake, I'm still with thee. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly. And thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. That is to say, uh, David is saying, I, with utmost passion, I am against these who would attempt to do the work that only God uh, should do. <clears throat> I hate, do not I hate uh, them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Well, that's David's Psalm 139. It is so perfectly suited as a reply to DNA uh, studies that are currently being undertaken in which men and shall I say godless men have taken it upon themselves to tamper with creation. And the results are guaranteed to be diabolical, disastrous, disruptive in every way you can possibly think of. Uh, I would invite you to read Psalm 139 and, and as you're reading it think about the kind of research that's going on today. Think about uh, the way uh, modern man is beginning to look at himself physically separate from God. Wow. Certainly we're living in the last days. Something to think about. I'm Gary Stearman. Keep watching. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter or follow us at facebook.com slash prophecywatchers. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.